I think everyone likes to think of themselves as being financially savvy, especially if, like me, you write about business topics. But how many of us truly understand finance terms that are bandied about, like gross profit and lifetime value? Like we may know that the term EBITDA stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, but how many people actually know how to calculate it? C.J. Gustafson knows. After a decade in finance, he's mastered all the accounting jargon, and a few years ago he realized that there was a market need for someone who could explain these terms in a way that's both entertaining and informative. So he launched Mostly Metrics, a Substack newsletter about finance, strategy, and operations at startups. CJ since grown the newsletter to over 42,000 subscribers, all while holding down his day job as a CFO at a tech startup. In my interview with him, we talked about why he launched the newsletter, how he balances his day job work in writing, and what his long-term plans are for the newsletter. Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and this is The Business of Content, the show about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. If you want to listen to an audio version of this show, subscribe to The Business of Content wherever you get your podcasts. And longtime listeners of this show know that it carries no advertising. The only way to support the painstaking work I do here is by becoming a paid subscriber to my newsletter. Subscribers get a half-hour introductory phone call with me. They also get to submit questions every month that I try my best to answer on this very show. Subscribe at simonowens.substack.com. That's simonowens.substack.com. Or just Google the words Simon Owens and newsletter. Okay, on to my interview with CJ. Hey CJ, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on, Simon. Long-time listener, first-time caller. So before we start talking about your newsletter, which is called Mostly Metrics, I wanted to start by just hearing about your background, specifically in finance. Like, I, I think you're currently a CFO at a startup right now. How did you, how did you get started in finance, and how did you make your, make your way up to the C-suite? Yeah, sure. So I majored in finance in college. I also majored in history, and I wrote for my school's newspaper the opinion column so like even though i'm a finance person i've actually always thought that my skills were more suited towards like writing and i don't know maybe talking about media or being in and around media it's always intrigued me but um to be honest i wanted to make a ton of money and i didn't know how to do that and uh i didn't know anything about the world and so i went into finance and um I don't know. In a lot of ways, I think it was a cool way to get a start in my career because I went and worked for a big four accounting firm helping do M&A transactions where I learned about business models. And I think what I liked more than consulting was just the learning aspect and being able to take what I learned and kind of put it into my own toolkit, which I ended up writing about later in life. And then from there, I went and worked in private equity for a while. Um, I think I was maybe like a B minus at that, but I did uh, have a couple couple hundred cups of coffee there and then I went over to the operator side and when I say operator side that's because um, I've been helping to operate and scale high growth software companies for the last maybe 10 years and um, you know managed to climb up the ranks within that to uh, to become a CFO now yeah and even though you say that you know um, maybe in another life you would have started out in writing and, and been doing it all along at least having this experience gave you um, you know, a lot of actual specialized knowledge, which will come to probably help you for the rest of your career if you did end up, you know, becoming a full-time writer going forward. So you, yeah. you mentioned that you did have experience writing for your newspaper. What was what was the column about? I had an opinion column in the BC Heights newspaper. So every week or every, I think it was every two weeks, I had a piece that would come out and basically they gave me like, 1,000 or 2,000 word area just to riff on whatever I wanted. And I think that got me comfortable with like having your own voice when it comes to writing. And I think some of that comes through in my writing today, even though it's like business oriented, it's probably not the straight laced business writing that people are used to. And, you know, you said that you kind of always had this passion for writing as you're working in finance. Were you, were you looking at any like finance writers or any other kinds of like newsletters or anything out there in the marketplace that you were really admiring and kind of saying, Oh, that looks like it would be cool to do. Yeah. For probably five years, I followed, uh, Tomas Tongas, who's a VC, uh, used to be at red point. Now he has his own, um, VC firm, but he was always writing about metrics and business models and how companies make money from a VC's perspective. And I always, like thought it would be so cool to be able to write about this but like i'm not a vc 
But then what I noticed is like VCs and startup operators kind of play in the same ballpark, but they may be playing different sports. So I could still write about some of the similar topics that he was writing about, even, uh, and this is kind of where the imposter syndrome comes in a little bit, which I guess we could touch on at some point. But I said, maybe I could fill that void because there really isn't anyone else covering these topics from like a CFO seat or like a, a younger person with a lot of ambition who's trying to learn about how businesses make money. Yeah, and like the kind of probably the nuts and bolts of a comp- of finance that, that, you know, all these like terms that I, you know, half these acronyms and stuff like that, you, you, you know, I could not tell you the difference between, you know, gross profit and regular profit and, and all yeah. this like, you know, EBITDA and stuff like that. Like I know like the broad terms for that are broad definitions of it, but at a granular level. And um, so based on your, your kind of reading of the landscape, there really wasn't anybody talking at that level or writing or creating content at that level. Yeah. And the dirty secret is that a lot of people who even have like an undergrad finance degree, or work in consulting or private equity or or startup operators a lot of times they're just too afraid to ask for an answer to a question that's seemingly simple but they talk about it in like these buzzwords um but when you drill into it you know it's it's not as intuitive or or like a you know an earned piece of knowledge that 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 you would think and i kind of caught myself in those gaps a lot of times trying to google things not being able to find the answer and I think part of my writing is really just scratching my own itch and then trying to make what seems like a complex topic simple, something that I basically Googled a hundred times and couldn't find a good answer. So I'm like, you know, screw it. I'm just going to write it myself. So when did you start kind of come up with the idea for this newsletter that you eventually launched? So um, it actually started out as, uh, have you ever heard of uh, the My First Millions podcast? Yeah, with Sam Parr. Yeah, and they kind of riff on business ideas. And what I started my newsletter as was like uh, like three levels deeper of like made up business cases for like these ideas that I was working a full time job and I couldn't um, like go out and just start a business because I was working. This was like me scratching my itch for like, hey, I think they should have you know <laughs> like stupid stuff like cameras at dog parks. So like when you, I was I would always be frustrated when I take my dog there and there are no other dogs. Like I wish I could have checked earlier. Or like I, I really like vintage like concert uh, t-shirts. Like what if there was a monthly box that could send you these concert t-shirts from like stock that they've left over. But I would take it and I would write up this intricate business case with a huge infographic and I would do like net dollar retention stats, uh, total addressable market like breakdowns. And I would use all these metrics on this like total wacky idea that I had been jamming on for business that didn't exist. And what I found though was people liked the, the metric part of it, but like they didn't really... I don't know if I can swear. They didn't really give a shit about my business idea. That didn't make any sense. Well, well I and mean, that, so like, so you actually launched a newsletter. What year year was this? It was. This was January of twenty twenty. Okay, and so and you, and you launched it on Substack. Yeah, and it was called Steal My Idea. Steal and My I Idea. I almost okay. deleted them all. They're still up there though. If you go all the way back to the beginning of my writing, because uh, I remember reading something about Packy McCormick that he had. Um, like a newsletter that was called something else at first and he didn't think it was all that good but he he said like i'm gonna keep it up just to see where like people if this ever gets big people can look back and see where i came from and i i thought back then like i have no idea if this will ever become big but like as embarrassing as it is i'm gonna leave it up there in case people do want to look back someday if it, if it does take off so uh you see the initial iteration of the newsletter is just like business ideas for businesses that don't exist and it turns out that nobody wants to read about businesses that don't exist would that that be a correct assessment yeah after like 15 of these that i made that each one probably took like eight to ten hours to do i realized nobody cares about a business that doesn't exist but what they do care about is the ability to tell a story and to use metrics to do it Mm -hmm. and when you say metrics what do you mean by that like graphs charts or like what what do you mean by using metrics Um, to tell a story Financial metrics, operating metrics, ways to describe how a business is trending. So like metrics in my world help you make decisions as to where to allocate resources. So like as a CFO, I look at a number of metrics day to day to see what our efficiency is, how much cash we're burning, um, you know, how many people we've hired, what our productivity is. And I explain the different lenses that you can view a business through by way of looking at metrics. 
in in these uh, early posts for the original newsletter, you were you were including some of these metrics within your kind of business plan for these non-existing businesses. Oh yeah, I mean, I'd, like I'd forecast out like how many dogs would go to the average park, how many parks were in, you know, uh, each state in the U.S. Like how much someone would pay per subscription, and like extrapolate this out. Um, so yeah, I was using like metrics on these made up things and people were more interested in like, Hey, how did you calculate that? Can you show me the formula for it? And that's where it started to what I call find audience market fit. When I started to flip it and just write about the metrics. And did you launch a separate newsletter for that? I kept the same one and just changed the name and then I bought the domain. Yeah. So that's mostly metrics.com. Exactly. So you, when did you switch over to, to that? Probably like a year and a half in. So, so not until 2021? Yeah, yeah, 2021. And that's like when people started to finally, I don't know, read my stuff other than my wife, my dog, and my mother-in-law. So t- walk me through like what, especially in those early days, what a mostly metrics issue or addition looked like. What, what was in it? It was really simple. So I would take like... Um, like uh, customer acquisition cost is like a metric that I look at a lot and I would break down the components of it, describe why it's important for a business. Um, and then I talk about like the art of it versus the science of it and then how to apply it day to day. And I think what people saw was, hey, people always talk about this customer acquisition cost thing and this hand wave emotion. This guy actually wrote it down in a way that's not only understandable, but it's actually kind of entertaining with some of the gifts that he puts in um, and pop culture references. Yeah, that's what it, that's what I was talking about earlier. I'll I'll, I'll I'll even use these terms in like my own podcast, where I'll say customer acquisition costs or lifetime value of cu- of the customer and stuff like that. But if you held a gun to my head, I wouldn't be able to necessarily you know calculate for you. Oh yeah, my... I mean, I was in finance using like the term gross margin as if like I understood what it was, and then I was one one day I was like, I better write this down in case somebody like finds out I'm like a fraud here and don't fully understand it. But now like I feel like. I have command of these things because it, like when you actually write something down and try to explain it something that's seemingly complex making it simple like you own that now it's like kind of yours i think before you're almost like renting the term or, or renting like whatever credibility you think by using that term but once you actually make it your own and explain it to somebody else um it, it becomes yours and so your so your those posts were just like okay I'm gonna in each newsletter I'm just gonna take one term or concept and just try to explain it. Yeah, and from that was probably like the first ten or so. It started off super simple. It was like I'm just gonna do this metric today. I'm gonna do that metric today, and then after a while I started to talk more about how businesses monetize, and then from there I just kept like stacking, um, kind of related topics that someone who cared about the first thing would care about the second thing and would care about the third thing so when you say how businesses monetize what does that mean like you would pick like amazon and just like break down how all the way a different way it monetizes more so like i remember i wrote a post and this was like one of my first experimental ones after just doing metrics were like what are the ways that you can make money off a business and i think i came up with five of them like you could uh charge like a subscription every month similar to like how you pay the same amount to your gym to netflix say like zoom is a subscription you could um you could have a take rate model where uh, you know like an airbnb charges a percentage of each transaction stripe charges a percent you could have an advertising model um and i went through like all these different ways that you can make money off a business and i was like I'm pretty sure I got every way. Can anybody else come up with a different bucket to put these into? And that one got, I think, passed around a lot because um, just by the way that I broke it down, like each method kind of occupied a different space in your mind and it made it real with like logos. That's something else I found through this whole thing that people really like real life examples. They like real life companies. um, And that's something I try to lean on. In what sense? Like as giving examples? Like real world examples? Real world examples because... A lot of the things I talk about are evergreen concepts that you would learn like maybe in school or from your boss, but putting like a real name logo to it or a company that's doing it or um, just using real life examples of like what people like tools they use in their daily life help help people conceptualize it and kind of make it their own. So you you find you finally found kind of like a groove and and figuring out like what the audience actually wanted, but like how did you find that audience? Where did they come from? 
a lot of them came from Twitter. Um, like, it, uh, I got wins early, but it was like getting wins ugly. And what I mean by that is every night I would sit down and I had a list that I made on my phone of 20 key terms and I would put them in the search bar on Twitter and I had like a post that would link back to each of those, tw- like that was relevant to those 20. And I'd fi- I'd go through like the relevant terms that came up and I'd write like a comment like, this is awesome, love how you broke it down. If anyone wants to nerd out more on net dollar retention, here's a post I wrote about it. And that helped me get to my first 1,000 free subscribers by, by every night doing that for probably four months. So if I understand correctly, so like if you wrote about uh, – gross margins you would put a search into twitter for the for the words gross margins gross margin yep and then you would find tweets that were about gross margins yeah that somebody had tweeted about within the last week and that had like over 100 likes and so i had like this wacky system where i would go through and i remember there was one i had wrote a post about stock options that did well like understanding stock options and at the time there were a bunch of startups where employees had got screwed over by like taking out loans for their stock options. So it's kind of like right place at the right time. And people were like, I don't fully understand this. And I would comment on the posts and I would throw that in. And that got me like hundreds of subscribers just because, I don't know, serendipity of the internet. So, so something that got over a hundred likes, you would reply to it saying, this is a great post. If you want to see more, go in here and go check out this own, piece. Yeah. Yeah. And did, did Twitter's algorithm, Twitter's like, you didn't get caught up in any kind of bot algorithms or anything like that since you were posting the same kind of thing at a, at a high frequency or anything like that? No, somehow I didn't. Um, I would actually try to write something like somewhat insightful for each of them, which took a bit of brain power, but um, like it didn't cut off my links, surprisingly. Interesting. And somehow, even though some of these were several days old, it stum- somehow was surfacing in people's feeds that... Your, your post was somehow showing up or maybe it, those tweets were still getting some traction and people who were looking to see the discussion and the replies and stuff like that were still seeing it. Yeah, I kind of looked at it and this is a weird thing to actually say aloud, but I guess I was thinking at the time, like, I want to own CAC payback period on Twitter. Whenever someone searches for CAC payback period, I want to be like the top three things that come up. So like the threads I was putting out were that. Um, Same thing with like net dollar retention rate. Like think about how small of a world that is. But I was like, if I can get that to like own that term, kind of like almost SEO, but like I wanted to own that nerdy realm of these metrics. And and it actually worked. Like I bet for a lot of them today, even if you Googled, I don't know, CAC payback period, I bet I would come up somewhat towards the top because I talk about it a lot and because I've had some that have done well. Because I write about a lot of evergreen stuff and that doesn't like go away. It's not like, um, like uh, I don't know, like when SVB collapsed, a lot of my stuff did well, but like no one goes back and looks at that. But other stuff that I've written, it's still relevant a year later. And so how did you then move on to that next stage of growth? So you're, you, you use that to get like your first thousand subscribers. What was kind of uh, uh, like, obviously that, that method is super laborious and doesn't scale very well. How oh, it sucks. You, yeah. How did you scale up from there? From there, it was um, the recommendations feature on Substack was huge for me. So I basically networked my way into getting uh, into like circles with, I think there were like eight, there were probably like four VCs that I can think of who now have newsletters all over 15,000 subscribers. And at the time, like maybe I had like 1,000, 2,000, they had like 5,000, 8,000, 10,000. And I networked into their group because we were writing about similar stuff, but I wasn't really competition to them because I was on the operator side, remember? So it's kind of like the split. Like, like I said before, we're in the same ballpark, we're playing different games. And so we recommended each other. It wasn't like, uh, I'm a product manager and this is another product manager. You see that a lot on Substack or like I'm the AI guy and this is the AI guy. I was kind of at this uh, unique intersection where like I could like not really compete with them, but also, you know, we got along. And what happened was on top of the recommendation algorithm, some people who were, I kind of look at, there's like three different uh, groups of people who would read it. So one is the younger person who's trying to learn to get better at their job to get paid more. And they also want to show it to their boss to signal that they're smart. So they would send it to their boss. Then uh, you would have the boss who's already a CFO who's maybe reading it. And he reads it or she reads it and they send it to their team like, hey, we should really think about doing this with our board deck next time. 
something I wrote about. And then you have this third group, which are the VCs who want to signal to their portfolio companies, I understand what you're going through and I understand what you're working on, and they, and they forward it to their portfolio companies. So I stumbled upon this, this weird uh, triangle of three groups who would send it around to each other, and I think that got a network effect where I eventually got it to this point after a while where I was getting like 25 new subscribers a day, 50 new subscribers a day, 75 new subscribers a day, 100 new subscribers a day. And now it's somewhere around like 75 new a day, but it's definitely this flywheel that uh, people get it from their recommendations and then those three groups of people or ICPs, ideal customer profiles shared around. And when you say you were like networking with all these VC writers, like what does that mean? Like you said that you you were getting recommended by them. Is it means like this literally the Substack's recommendation so that when basically when people would sign up for their newsletter, Substack would automatically like re- recommend your newsletter because they listed you as one of their recommended Substacks? That that was my that was my goal, but I would reach out to them and ask like for a phone call and also talk about other business stuff because like they see that I'm at a venture back company and um, ask for advice there. But I would literally like try to, you know, form a business relationship in a sense with them. So like I did, I talked to everybody who I think I was recommending and they were recommending me at first um, because it created more of like a person to person thing. It wasn't just like I DM them say, Hey, you want to recommend each other? It was like, I tried to get on the phone with each of them. And then at the end, I was like, by the way, I love your stuff. Do you think we could recommend each other? And you also like did some guest writing for some business blogs as well. Yeah, that was another uh, avenue for growth. So a growth, and this isn't really like a hack, but I guess it's like an earned secret that a lot of these companies, B2B software companies, are looking for like an independent voice and they also don't want to create all the content on their own. So you can go after people who are not the CMO, so somewhere mid-level in the organization, and contact them and say, hey, uh, I, I'm wondering if you'd want to partner on a piece together. I have this idea about like spend management software or fp and tools. And they eat it up because it makes their life easier. It comes from somebody else. But it's cool for you because they're going to share it with their email distribution list. And because now I have a major logo of a billion dollar company saying that they're like, you know, supporting my stuff. So that that helped me a lot. Hey, I just want to interrupt the programming for just a moment to note that you are at the halfway point of the video. If you made it this far, then that's probably a sign that you like this sort of content. So maybe just take a second to subscribe to the channel below. If you're feeling especially generous, you can hit the like button. Okay, back to the show. So it was actually like a, it was a existing company that had like a blog or something like that that you were, and then because they had an email list or social, an already existing social media presence, they would like heavily promote it on that. Yeah, all these, um, all these B2B software companies that are venture backed, like say Post Series B, like they have email lists that could be hundreds of thousands of people. And so I would do a guest post for them and they'd send it out in their newsletter. So there was one company, I remember SecFi, that I did a bunch of them just for free. And I also love their product too. So like I could speak to like what the value they were bringing. And that helped me get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. I don't know if it was a thousand, but I remember at the time they had a list that was tens of thousands of people. And I did three guest posts for them. They sent it out there and then also put it on their blog. And I was like, this is pretty cool. Let me contact it contact this credit card company for businesses. So I did it for them and then I did an FP&A tool. And I was doing all this for free, but after I got like 10 of these companies that I wrote something for, and they kind of co-signed me in a way, their competitors would also see it and say, oh damn, I wish CJ would write something for us. And then eventually I started to say, I'll do it, but uh, it's gonna cost money. And were you just, was it just cross posts of your newsletter or you're writing like content on top of the newsletter you were already doing? It was cross posts of, of my newsletter. Uh-huh. So like, obviously you have a high pressure job. How were you finding the time to do all this? It's honestly the way that I catalyze what I'm learning. A lot of what I write about is what I'm learning maybe that month or within that quarter. So it's top of mind and it's my way of journaling it so I don't forget. And the second thing is, um, <laughs> to be honest, I get anxiety when I'm not working on something. Like I'd be off trying to start a business. I did that uh, a long time ago, 
um, on the side on weekends, um, which is a whole another story. But um, like I don't do well with with uh, extra time. It it gives me anxiety, so I always need to be working on something. And then um, I don't want this part to sound like arrogant or anything, but like writing isn't like a struggle for me. Like I can sit down and bang out a piece within an hour and everybody will be like, how, how did you find the time to do that? And I'm like, it didn't take that much time. So I know I'm not the greatest writer in the world, but for my tone and the way, the style that I write, it's not as time consuming as I think a lot of people believe it is. Yeah. I'm jealous. I, I max out at like three to 400 words a, a, an hour most times. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm not saying the quality of my writing is like any better than people's. I'm just saying like for what I'm producing, I love it. I enjoy it. And it's not as like, it, it's easy for me to write in that style easier than people think. And so as your audience is growing, you're getting recommended more and more newsletters are recommending you. Uh, you're growing into the thousands of readers. Like, how are you interacting with your audience? What kind of feedback were you getting? How was that informing the product? It's funny. Um, I think at one point, as more people started to join, I almost for a little while started to write for like this hypothetical smart person that I thought was out there. And I had to realize that like just because more people are reading it, you got to stay true to what you think the right topics are. And somebody asked me like, who's your ideal customer? And I eventually came to the conclusion it's me. And so sometimes I'll get feedback from the audience, but I honestly don't, (laughs) I honestly don't listen that much. Um, I just write about whatever I think is relevant at the time. But you certainly haven't, have you set up like a Slack group or anything like that to like, or is it just kind of I want, more ad hoc? I want zero part in that. You couldn't pay me a million dollars to run a Slack group. Or any kind of, or any kind of community or anything like that. You want this no. to be mainly a one, you don't have dreams of having this huge interactive community. You want this to be, for the most part, a one way kind of broadcasting outlet. I just don't think that's scalable and... Like you said, I do, uh, I, my job's not the, uh, my job isn't a walk in the park either. So like I can't trade time for money. I need to do things with leverage and running like a community or talking to people every day wouldn't be a great use of it. I, I mean, I probably get five people a week who reach out on LinkedIn or email me asking for time. And I wish I could talk to all of them, but that just wouldn't be scalable. Yeah. So when did you introduce paid subscriptions into your revenue mix? Like when did you actually start monetizing the newsletter? January, uh, mid-January of this year. So it's been 10 months. Yeah. So you were running it for over a year as a free product before you started launching. The, I think over you... two years. But w- one of those years were, were the crazy business ideas that nobody cared about. Yeah. Um, and so how much did you charge when you launched the paid subscriptions? I uh, I copied Lenny and uh, Gurgly. I'm probably butchering his name. Sorry, but uh, I kind of look up to them as like the the category experts within theirs, and I'm like the next department down the hall for the person that we're writing for. So, 15 a month and 150 a year, and a lot of the people in my niche, which I stumbled into, can expense it. Yeah, and you're referencing Lenny's newsletter. And the Pragmatic Engineer, which are some of the top, uh, the most subscribed to newsletters on Substack. I think they're they're both tech newsletters. Yeah, yeah. I look up to them a lot and copy a lot of their learnings. Uh huh. So once you launched the paid version, what what did subscri- what did your readership get? Like, what was the kind of breakdown of paid versus free content? Um. Well, so to start, I was doing every Tuesday, just once a week, and then for the paid, I started to do every other Thursday. And then I got to a point where I was like, you know what, bandwidth wise, I can, I'm fine with my current job. Nothing's fallen by the wayside. I can do every week on Thursday. So once on, uh, free on Tuesday to everybody, paid on Thursday to everybody. And is there any differentiation between the two other than just the days they come out? The content's a bit different. So Tuesday is usually a little shorter and it's more about metric breakdowns and benchmarks for operational um, excellence. And then Thursday is more related to career advice, deep dives on like upskilling and a finance topic, like how to calculate contribution margin and talk to department leaders about it, um, or how to calculate total addressable market. And then, um, compensation stuff. I find that people are more willing to pay if you have a post that impacts their comp directly. 
And so how do you drive conversions from your free list to your paid? I got to admit, man, this is something I struggle with. And um, I think I actually emailed you on it for, for advice. So I'm sending out, so I have 35,000 free right now. And I'm bombarding all 35,000 every Thursday, whether you're free or paid with a paywall post, like a third of the way down. And um, I don't know. Sometimes I get frustrated because I'll admit I do get unsubscribes from the free, but at the same time, they're not paying me. But I do advertise in my Tuesday newsletter where I can make some money. So it's a trade-off. It's a constant trade-off, and like it's, I wrestle with it every day. Yeah, so you're, you're, you don't like the idea that people are getting annoyed and unsubscribing to the newsletter. I don't. It's an ego hit. <laughs> mm-hmm. But in terms of like how successful has that been in terms of actually converting the free subscribers and the paid by basically, so what you're saying is you send a you send the paid version out and then to the rest of the non-paying members you send what Substack basically allows you to send a truncated version where you get to set where the paywall kicks in where they could read a certain amount of the newsletter for free after a certain point they they. It says if you want to keep reading, you have to pay. You say that you, you give them about a third of the newsletter for free. That's right. Is that your most effective like driver of conversions? It is. And I think also what I'm finding is it depends on the topic to convert as well. Um, I did a post. I did a series. It was a five-part series on annual planning. So that's like when companies budget for the next year. Yeah, very nerdy. All those people out there listening who are like, who the hell is this guy who writes about these very uh, arcane topics um but that did really well because it was timely because people were going through it at the time and because it was something that i had worked ten thousand hours on in my life that i could write about and was uniquely qualified to speak to so that one converted really well but some of them like only get three four five conversions some of them may get 30 conversions so it, it really depends on the topic and sometimes i feel like i'm throwing darts at the wall do you, do you feel like it, when you look at like net growth and subscribers that you're still growing at like a healthy pace though? Net growth has slowed down a little bit. So it used to be between 2,500 and 3,000 a month. Now it's probably 1,500 to 2,000 a month. Well, no, I mean net growth in terms of paid subscribers. Oh, paid? Yeah. I mean, it's working. <laughs> do I wish it was a little bit faster? I think everybody does. Um so I don't know. It's working though. So and and you mentioned that you're now you're now having advertisers in the free version. Obviously, you have a very high value kind of readership. You mentioned CV, CFOs, also just finance people, VC, but generally people with a lot of money and huge budgets behind them. What what has been kind of the demand that you've seen on the advertising front, and what's been your strategy for going out and getting those advertisers? I'm a finance guy. I hate doing sales and having to sell is like my worst nightmare, but I'm slowly getting better at it. Like, uh, I was terrified of like talking to people about trying to get them to buy up an ad spot, but now I'm much more comfortable. Now I created a sponsorship deck. Now I have like, this is how much a month costs. I, I learned the hard way. Like I don't want to be selling every single spot. That's like a hard road to go through. And it's just so much like bandwidth that get taken away. And, um, I wasn't actually doing it for a while. Like my wife is in sales, so I would have her send the emails and stuff. Um, But eventually I would have to get on the phone every once in a while and talk to people. And this is all like after work at night. I'm talking to somebody on the West Coast about buying an ad spot because like I don't have time to do this during the day. So that was kind of stressing me out. And at one point I was like, I don't even know if I want to sell ads, but it's easy money to make. Um, And like you said, it's an audience that all these companies are going after the people buying it, their products aren't even using their own money. So it's kind of like they're willing to pay even more for it because it's a high, you know, uh, purchasing power. Um, But like next year, I'm thinking about maybe doing an exclusive sponsor for the whole year or minimally just selling a month block at a time. So I only have to do like six to 12 sales. But you're having to do, it sounds like mostly outbound, cold outbound pitching in order to get these advertisers. Um, Half of them come inbound. Half of them will fill out a form and ask me about it. And what are, what's kind of the typical uh, sponsor for your, like what kind of product category? A lot of it's, uh, like if you've heard of like uh, a NetSuite, like similar to a NetSuite. NetSuite sponsor my podcast, but not the newsletter yet. Um, 
but like if you think about in the same category of those or like a uh like a brex or a ramp what, 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 explain what these companies are not everybody oh going, oh yeah. uh yeah <laughs> sorry man I, I went into finance dork mode there so like um when you buy something at work and you expense it there's a software behind that that helps keep track of it or like when you want to travel at work and expense it or an accounting software uh a budgeting software those would be the main ones so the the kinds of like b2b or our enterprise type of um services for that accountants and finance people within a business would use yeah anything a cfo would buy yeah okay really interesting so yeah so like as you said um not only are they are, are these like high priced items but the people who are buying them they're not spending their own money so um they're, they're willing they're willing to pay you know pretty high cpms given your very targeted audience i actually tell them i don't play the cpm game like um you can I mean, when you some, average, yeah, yeah, you don't charge by CPM, but when you when you calculate the CPMs, I'm, I'm guessing they're relatively high. Yeah, they're horrified by it, so I say don't even look at it that way. Yeah, interesting, and it's ma it's mainly kind of direct direct response type of advertising. Yeah, a lot of it's like trying to get people to sign up for like an ebook or a webinar. So um, I'll give them like 100 to 150 words in it, a banner image and a call to action. Mm -hmm. And you have no interest in being like creating custom content, like being the host of that webinar or something like that. No, I've, I've done that for a few of them and it's pretty fun actually to get to engage with people. Like that's the type of engagement I'm, I'm cool with, but like one-on-one -on -one calls with everybody wouldn't scale or like a Slack community wouldn't scale, but like show up for an hour and talk about metrics, like with fellow operators, I'll do that and helps them sell stuff and then helps me, you know, pay for the daycare bills. Well, would you ever want to do some kind of like high price product like that? That's like a, you know, almost like a mastermind or some kind of like super premium tier of, of networking for CFOs or anything like that. I find the CFO groups aren't that scalable. Um, well, you, you don't have to have scale them. You just have to charge a lot of money. You, you build it, I'll run it, Simon. <laughs> um, and then you said that you mentioned a podcast. What are you doing on that front? Yeah, sure. So it's new. It's called Run the Numbers. We've done eight episodes so far. It's produced on the Turpentine Network. They're kind of like the ringer or bar stool for business podcasts. And uh, I interview world-class CFOs and talk about finance stuff. Interesting. And uh, is the Turpentine Network, like, what, what is their value proposition? Are they actually doing the, the ad sales for the podcast and the production and stuff like they that? They do the ad sales, they do the production, and they help with the scheduling. So, like, all things I'm not qualified to do or have time to do. And so, like, their pitch to me was, hey, you're doing really well in the newsletter. We think that you should do a podcast. And I said, I'd love to, but I do not have time to do that. And they said, well, we'll help you scale to, to do it. And then... Um, hopefully network effects kick in with the other podcasts on the network because people who listen to podcasts are always looking for more podcasts. So you, you're you kind of burning the candle at both ends. You said you don't mind it because you always have to be busy, but I'm sure there are times you're frustrated that you could be doing more. You probably see a lot of potential with this business in terms of growth and a lot of other things you could be doing. I mean, what are your ambitions with it? Like, obviously, you have a full-time job, so you're probably not going to be announcing on this podcast that you're quitting your job or anything like that. But mm -hmm. is the, do you think there's, there's a future where you could be a full-time content creator and kind of transition away from, you know, a full-time job in finance? I don't know. I mean, um, part of me is, like, you, it's cool if you can own a category and be a category of one. And I don't know, maybe someday I can become like the world's like 1000th best, best CFO. I don't know. The jury's still out. Could I become the number one content creator, writer, podcaster, business guy for, you know, finance people? Maybe that would be pretty neat. Like I'm sure the number one pickleball player in the world makes a lot of money, even though it's like a small category, I'm a big category now. Well, so I, well, I could think you become it. the Lenny's newsletter of finance, basically? That that would be the goal if I did it. That definitely would. That would be the comp that I'd be trying to go after. I think I'd be a little bit different though than him in the sense that he's really into the VC side of it. I've tried some of that, and it just didn't really get me out of bed in the morning and. I didn't like asking people I knew to invest in stuff if I was doing like a syndicate. What I did discover though is I love data and selling data. 
in creating benchmarking resources. So, like, I think what Anthony Pompliano has done, like, I'm not a big crypto person, but I admire what he's done with, like, uh, building an audience and then finding products to sell them. So the concept of um, going from content to commerce, I would want to do that. So instead of, like, really doubling down on using your audience to get investment opportunities, I'd want to sell a product of value particularly data because the marginal cost to produce that's pretty low and because i enjoy it and understand it well uh, back to them whether it be a benchmarking resource or you know information on equity compensation or something like that so if i did do it it would also be paired with building a business so you think like research a research report or something like that that people can pay like almost like a forester or something like that a high ticket price yeah like something that's a 500 dollar per month subscription instead of you know 15. So if you, let's say you were to quit your job tomorrow and work full time and you suddenly you had 50, 60 hours a week to work on this full time, that's the next thing you would tackle, not necessarily putting out more content for the newsletter or anything like that. I think I would go a bit deeper on some of the topics I do, So, but I don't think it would be just content. I think it would be using the content to create a business. So like Doug DeMuro, I think is awesome, who the Cars and Bids guy. Um, he got an investment from the churning group for the company. And basically what he did is he took his YouTube content and said, Hey, I'm like uniquely qualified to create a marketplace for all these funky cars. Why don't I use my audience for that? I think he did a really good job. Same thing with the, uh, the meat eater guy, same thing with the Hodinky watch guy. Um, all these people I kind of look to as potential examples of what I could maybe do down the road with with this finance operator audience. Yeah, although I guess I would say as someone who studies a lot of these businesses, for every one of those, you get like a, a like 100 uh, media people who try to get into products and realize that they're just not product people what's, whatsoever. Like build, building a marketplace is like this incredibly difficult endeavor that takes entirely different skill sets than creating content. And you see like a lot of um, you, you see like a lot of media companies kind of wade into that and then yeah. kind of, uh, you know, come out with their tails between their legs after it doesn't really take off. The difference is, though, I do help run companies to bring a product to market. And that's what I write about. I'm not like, a, you know, like a, a pickleball reporter who then tries to create a marketplace for, I don't know, something like I'm uh, helping to lead a company that is a marketplace right now. So I'm not saying I would nail it. I'm just saying that I'd come from. A different background than I think some of the people who were just in media to begin with. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, CJ, well, those were all the questions I have for you. Where can people find you online? You can find me at mostlymetrics.com. You can also find uh, me on the Run the Numbers podcasts on Spotify and Apple, wherever you get your podcasts. Awesome. Well, this is a lot of fun. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Simon. Appreciate it.